Hi, I'm here today with Keith Devlin from the uh, Stanford University's H-Star Institute. And Keith, you've been involved in MOOCs for a little while now. Well, in, from a Stanford perspective, I'm one of the, the early adopters. Yes, I gave my first MOOC about two months after Coursera became an independent company. It was on the Coursera platform. And what attracted you to that? Um, I've spent most of my career doing science outreach, I've done, I'm the math guy in NPR, I write for newspapers, magazines, when, when MOOCs were being developed, when the platform was being developed, a new platform, what became Coursera and Udacity, when that was being developed at Stanford, I was interested in the fact that that was coming along and I always said to myself, when that's ready, I want to try that and see if I can reach a different audience. I've got this evangelical urge to sort of get the word about mathematics out to a general community. And when it was coming out, I... I just sort of said, I want to give one of these things. By then, in fact, there was a huge velocity and Coursera was almost a company. And so by the time I put my course together, Coursera did exist and that was my platform. But it was just this urge to try and take the word about mathematics to a broader community than the various communities I'd hitherto reached. So that's an interesting perspective uh, to, to come to your teaching with an evangelical urge. I, I'm, sh I'm sure there are a number of teachers who identify with that, yeah. but also there are, are plenty of teachers who don't necessarily think about that, think about their classes in that way. So is that uh, what you think MOOCs are particularly good at? Uh, I, think they have, I think they have huge potential. Okay. Um, and I'm doing what most of us do, I'm extrapolating from a sample of one, which is me. Right. I'm a kid from a, a sort of simple working class family in the north of England post Second World War. I am sitting where I am now, well, partly because of United Airlines, but more generally, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing MOOCs, I'm at Stanford, because when I was a kid, I was turned on by academics who were writing popular books on mathematics and science. Mm. It was the 1950s science popularizers that made me aware of science and mathematics and stimulated me to become a mathematician because the regular systems weren't reaching someone like me. There were schools, there was, the schools were pretty good, but it wasn't geared towards me. England in those days was geared towards the Oxford and Cambridge people that were sort of birthrighted into that. And I was reached by these other people. And I've always felt that if we can offer that opportunity, I don't care if the success rate is, is one out of a hundred, give me a chance to reach that one out of a hundred and I'll go for it because that's how you can change lives. And if you can change enough lives, you can change society. Now we're here at a MOOC conference yeah. today and we're talking about applications of MOOCs for all kinds of purposes. Certainly reaching non-traditional students and non-traditional learners is one of them, many others. Uh, what, do you, what do you hope to learn from the conference and from the, the grants that are being given out here and from the research that's going uh, on? The main thing I learned is the main thing I learned from every academic gathering or everything else, how little I or anybody else really knows. And in MOOCs that's true in space because these things are so new. As, as George Seaman said when he opened it early this morning, there are no experts in this business. Um, I've spent the last year and a half traveling the globe giving talks as an expert on MOOCs for the simple reason I've been giving them for 18 months. You know, so it's as simple as that. You know, the real experts come from Canada, although they're slightly different MOOCs, um, you know, back in 2006. But this is very new. We don't really know what MOOCs are. We don't know which populations they're really going to serve. I'd put money on the fact, and in fact, I've actually implicitly, I've put quite a lot of my own time and money on the fact that these are going to change society. They will change the higher academic l landscape, but quite how they'll change it, I think no one can possibly say with confidence. They're very new. And one thing that history tells us is that when something new comes along and we're thinking it's going to change A, A is probably the thing it won't change. It'll change things B, C and D that we didn't even think were in the sphere of influence at the time. You know, computers were invented to do number crunching. They weren't invented to provide social media interactions and communications media. We don't yet know what question MOOCs are ask, answering. For sure, they're answering some big questions. When we've answered them, we'll look back and say, you know, that was kind of obvious, wasn't it? Well, no, it isn't obvious. And now it's going to be on video. Someone saying, we don't know where they're going to go. But ask me in 10 years time and I'll look back and say, yeah, yeah, we sort of knew that implicitly. Yeah, no, we didn't. <laughs> we hadn't a clue. So let's say I'm a faculty member. Yeah. I haven't done a MOOC before. Yeah. I don't know much about MOOCs. What you're saying, maybe the idea of the evangelical urge appeals to me, but maybe also this idea that MOOCs could upend everything makes me a little nervous. Uh -huh. What do you say to that faculty member about how they should think about MOOCs and approach them? If you're a faculty member, you should very much be interested in upending everything. Because if society's paying you one way or another, 
pretty good salary to sit back and think about the future of, of society, then that's what we should be doing. It's our job to rattle the change that way and to look for new things. We are given the privilege of thinking about the future. That is one of the things we do. We preserve the past, we curate the present, and then we, we think about the future. So, first of all, that's what we should be doing. Um, we certainly should not be worried about the negative effects. Um, and we definitely shouldn't be worried about losing our own jobs. Very few people in society have that privilege, and I don't think we should have that either, quite frankly. We should be doing research because that's what we are paid to do and that's what we've chosen to do. The stuff we read about, about 10 universities in 18 months or whatever, I mean, that's just the initial sort of hyperbole that came out. But when I look at education, I look at something that fundamentally is not scalable. Mm. So the issue is, and efficiency is important, so the issue is what parts are scalable and how can you take away the stuff that can be done in a MOOC or some other medium and free up the time of the experts because when it comes down to it, education is about what people do when they get together. Really, it comes down to two people. Now, those, the two might be spread one to 20 or one to 25, but the real learning takes place when two eyes make contact and there's an interaction and something happens. So that is not scalable. But we can make that happen more often by scaling up the stuff that can be scaled. The lecture, for example, which essentially is a medieval photocopy machine. It was the only way to get man many copies of a handwritten manuscript. How the lecture survived the photocopy machine and everything else beats me. I suspect the standard one hour lecture has finally been killed off or is about to be killed off by MOOCs and quite frankly good riddance. But boy, that means we can have more research seminars. We can have more close knit conversations because that's when learning takes place. And so MOOCs offer huge potential in their present form to produce greater efficiencies. But even more exciting, they offer the potential to give teachers and learners much better chances to interact. So I see this as an opportunity to making education much better, not making it much cheaper. I can't think of a better note to end a conversation on. David, thank you very much. My pleasure.